Many of the things you most care about depend on certain key elements, the names of which you've probably never heard of. The defence of your country depends on those things as well. And right now, China has control of them and it has specifically said that it's planning to use that control against us. Well, we should probably find out what's going on. So let's have a look. A global competition of critical importance is kicking into high gear across the world. Right now, none of the commentators suggest that the United States, the EU or the UK are in a winning position, rather the opposite. Currently, we're extremely vulnerable to those that might be actively considering how they can do us harm. And this competition is over rare earth minerals, a set of elements which are critical to national defence and to the green energy revolution and to modern electronics generally. In other words, all of the things that are growing in importance right now. Which kind of means that the pressure's on. We saw how the various world powers behaved in the scramble for PPE equipment and for vaccines over COVID-19 when the pressure was on. Well-ordered supply chains crumbled as host countries grabbed what they needed, regardless of who owned them, based on the old-fashioned notion of, you know, paying for stuff. Well, if that's for precedent, then we should be worried. Production of rare earth minerals is astonishingly concentrated in China, giving it a near monopoly position. China leads in every link of the supply chain, from production to refining, as well as having a dominant place in other key metals such as nickel, lithium and cobalt. It controls roughly 80% of the world's production capacity for rare earths and more than 90% of its refining. Deng Xiaoping was reputed to have once said, there is oil in the Middle East, but there are rare earths in China. If he did actually say that, well, he wasn't wrong. In a minute, we'll look at the gritty end of the politics of this. But first, let's touch on some of the detail of why it matters and why you should care. The rare earth elements are a set of 17 silvery white soft heavy metals which have different electronic and magnetic properties. And it's these properties that make them highly useful. To bring it closer to home, for example, an iPhone will typically contain eight different rare earth metals. On the plus side, one property that they don't have is that of being especially rare. For example, the rare earth element cerium is actually the 25th most abundant element in the earth's crust, being about as common as copper. Only the highly unstable promethium is actually scarce. But you just don't find these elements in great big chunks waiting to be mined. They have to be extracted in a process that can be both expensive and it has to be well managed if it's not going to have a big impact on the local environment. You have to get rare earths to a high quality consistent state to be usable. And that's a process that is easier said than done. The materials are used for so many different technologies, including some that are held to be highly strategically important. So on defence, rare earths are critically important to guidance and control systems, such as smart bombs and Tomahawk cruise missiles, drones such as the Predator unmanned aircraft, electronic warfare tools such as jamming devices, electromagnetic railguns, targeting and weapon systems, laser weapons, as well as fighter aircraft and communication satellites. Then there's the clean energy revolution. The wind turbine market is expected to result in a global growth of 30% in the use of rare earth magnets. Wind turbines are thought to use about 600 kilograms of rare earth metals each. Rare earth magnets are in more than 90% of hybrid and electric vehicles, as well as in their braking systems and other electronics. Rare earths are also used in solar panels. A study last year for the European Commission established that the move towards zero carbon energy would push up the demand for rare earths used in magnets by 10 times by 2050. Then there's the tech industry generally. 
Rare earths are used in loudspeakers, computer hard drives, camera and telescope lenses, studio lighting, LED screens, fibre optics, X-ray and MRI scanning. Also, aircraft engines, lasers, nuclear reactor control rods and a whole lot more besides. Whether you think we need strong defence in the age of a new rising superpower, whether you think modern life should be transformed with greener technology, or whether you just want to keep on enjoying the benefits that you've, you know, kind of rather been taking for granted so far, you have a big stake in how this plays out. So let's look at why a lot of commentators are concerned about where we are on this, and then afterwards we'll look at what's actually being done about it, or indeed what should be done about it. Firstly, China's dominance. In 2020, China's own output of rare earths was 140,000 megatons, which was up from 132,000 in 2019. That represents 58% of global production. Chinese producers have a quota for rare earths production. That quota for the first half of 2021 was up by over 27%. In contrast, the US produced just 38,000 megatons in 2020, which was up from 28,000 the previous year. Myanmar mined 30,000 megatons in 2020. It has a close relationship with China. And so far, since the military coup, there haven't been any trade disruptions, so that seems as though it's continuing. Production in Australia in 2020 dropped to 17,000 tonnes from 20,000 the year before. I don't know if that's because of the coronavirus situation. It is expected to grow again in the future. Indeed, it's one of the bright hopes for the West, since Australia holds the sixth largest known reserve of rare earths in the world. Australian company Linus is planning to boost its production, and other companies such as Northern Minerals are moving in as well. And then you're down to figures like 8,000 megatons from Madagascar and even 2,700 megatons from Russia. So significant dominance in production for China for the time being. But it's not just about where it's mined. Even more important is where it's processed. 95% of the world's processing also takes place in China. China is simultaneously the world's biggest reserve, producer, consumer, processor, importer and exporter of rare earths. The EU depends on China for 98% of its total supply of rare earth elements, the US at the moment for 95%, including for material mined in the US that has to then be sent to China for processing. And that would be fine, so long as China is a stable and a reliable partner, which is not how things are shaping up in the 21st century. China has already shown its willingness to use its stranglehold on rare earths as a weapon. In 2010, a dispute with Japan led it to place an export ban of the minerals to that country for a couple of months before the problem was resolved. Japan, with its huge strengths in high technology manufacturing, would potentially have been significantly hit if that ban had continued for an extended period. And more generally in 2010, Beijing restricted the export of the elements, much to the annoyance at the time of the Obama administration. Similar measures are now actively being reviewed in Beijing by a China that feels more criticised and under attack. In January, the Chinese Ministry of Industry and Information Technology drafted proposals for new export controls on rare earths with a view to hitting the production of F-35 fighter jets in the United States. Each of those planes requires 417 kilograms of rare earths to operate, according to a congressional research report. And this was in retaliation for the US approval of an arms deal for Taiwan, relating to air defence missiles made by Lockheed Martin, which also makes the F-35s. In May 2019, the China People's Daily, the mouthpiece of the Chinese Communist Party, asked this question, will rare earths become a counter-weapon for China to hit back against the pressure the United States has put on for no reason at all? And it then answered its own question. The answer is no mystery. We advise the US side not to underestimate the Chinese side's ability to safeguard its development rights and interests. Don't say we didn't warn you. If we're into a world where we have more open competition and indeed hostile interference, which does seem to be the case, 
then simply moving extraction of rare earths out of China is only solving part of the problem. Because even with alternatives, you're talking about a long and potentially vulnerable supply line. Rare earth minerals in their raw state are transported via the same large commercial ships that carry other commodities. So if you are transporting rare earths from the Australian company Linus to Galveston, Texas for processing, it would be shipped for between 10 to 15,000 nautical miles, a long supply line and vulnerable to China's navy, which is now larger than America's. China's naval presence could at least influence the routes that rare earth shipments to the US are made, increasing lead times and cost. And you can see now how the US is starting to respond. In the closing days of the Trump administration, it announced that it would reform the first fleet for the first time in more than four decades, the intent being to commit more American capacity to waters off Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean, including the important Strait of Malacca. For whatever reason, the US was slow to learn the lesson when China hit Japan's imports in 2010. That has changed. Whether it's the political atmosphere since the Trump trade war with China and the fallout from the coronavirus, or whether it's the ramping up of demand for clean energy sources and things like electric vehicles, whatever it is, the situation now has everyone's attention. And it did take a while. Former President Trump was hit by derisive headlines when he offered to buy Greenland. Greenland, as we'll hear later, has significant reserves of rare earths. Amidst the mockery, the strategic point of a move was somewhat lost, but not anymore. President Biden recently signed an executive order to review the US critical supply chains. The UK Prime Minister has likewise ordered civil servants to draw up plans to end Britain's reliance on China for these crucial supplies. The EU has been doing likewise for some time. You might suggest that these moves are all a bit late. Realising that you're in a strategically weak position isn't the same as getting yourself out of that position. Is it already too late to respond? Well, there is a lot to do, and reliance on China isn't going to end overnight. China will know very well that whatever power it can exert in this space is going now to be a diminishing asset over time. What's it going to do with that knowledge? Will it throw its weight around for short-term advantage while it has the most leverage? Or does it look to the long term? So maybe it reassures the world that it is actually a reliable partner. Nobody needs to worry about what it might do. That's a matter for judgment. And so far, we've seen them do both. But you can't really do both because it's for throwing your weight around part that attracts all the attention and creates the reactions, unsurprisingly. So therefore, the global race is now officially on to get hold of sources of rare earths that don't come from China. For instance, one known source is being very actively targeted, and that is the tennis ball-sized mineral-rich nodules that are found in some places on the seabed. Those nodules could be the source of millions of tonnes of rare earth minerals along with copper and nickel and cobalt manganese. The UK government, China, Japan, South Korea, Belgium, Germany and France are all involved in projects looking at those in the deep Pacific Ocean. The UK, for instance, believes that its Pacific project could yield an output of 3 million tonnes of nodules per year, which would be more than enough to meet its domestic demand. So there's a lot at stake, and a lot of countries are chasing the prize. Also in the frame has been Greenland, Greenland has vast resource potential and has become a target for competition between the US, China and the rest. For the West, Greenland is a huge opportunity to reduce that dependency on China. And it has something of a head start. Because the three countries most active in Greenland's mining sector are the UK, Australia and Canada. And for all that the headlines a couple of years ago have been taken by Trump's offer to buy the country... The US had been more quietly signing a new Memorandum of Understanding on cooperation to boost Greenland's mining sector. But the US wasn't alone. 
China has been similarly keen to take even more control of rare earths from outside its own territory. So early in 2003, China's first research centre in the Arctic was opened and Beijing was interested in opening a similar facility in Greenland. A comprehensive strategic partnership was formed with Denmark, which owns Greenland, although the territory is self-government. That agreement formed in 2013. So everyone was focusing in on the possibilities. And in particular, with a proposed major mining exploration project that was being led by a company called Greenland Minerals, an Australian mining firm whose largest shareholder also happens to be Chinese. The project was controversial. A recent poll showed 63% of Greenlanders were opposed to it. And the dispute around it led to the collapse of the social democratic government. Then just a week ago, a major potential spanner was thrown in the works. Because Inuit attacker deed won the general election with 37% of the votes. This left-wing party campaigned on its opposition to the project. So that's a big setback for China and also for Australia. Now that doesn't mean that it all goes away. The tug of war over rare earth elements in Greenland is going to continue. The opposition to the mining proposal wasn't necessarily opposition to the principle of mining per se. Mika Mered, a lecturer on Arctic affairs in Paris, was quoted as saying this, it's not that Greenlanders don't want mining, but they don't want dirty mining. So the dance will continue. This isn't a static situation, and it doesn't necessarily all go one way, by which I mean China has its challenges as well. Because let's be clear, China achieved its dominant position as the processor of rare earths, largely following the logic of race to the bottom policy. It ignored the environmental impacts of processing. And you can do that up to a point when you're not a democracy. It tolerated widespread illegal mines and it benefited from offering the lowest global prices that nobody else could compete with. But that sort of advantage comes with a cost, a heavy cost. Sooner or later, you're going to have to pay that bill. On the one hand, the environmental devastation has had a massive impact. Jiangxi province, for instance, is dotted with small surface ponds where rare earths leaching was carried out. The wastewater has high toxicity and there's a huge amount of contamination downstream, including in the Dongjiang River, which provides drinking water for Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Guangzhou and elsewhere. China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology estimated that the clean-up bill for southern Jiangxi province could amount to 38 billion yuan or around 5.5 billion dollars. On the other hand, the government has had to actively crack down in the end on the network of gang-run illegal rare earth mines. As recently as 10 years ago, the criminal gangs in southern China were responsible for around half the world's supply of heavy rare earths, which are the most valuable kinds. Indeed, for those specific minerals, the crime rings within its own borders were the government's only effective worldwide competition. That quota system that I mentioned earlier was a big part of China's response as it shut the gangs down and as it shuts down the environmental disaster zones. And that has left six state-owned mining companies responsible for what's left. Some people have argued that the largely Western companies that benefited from the cheap rare earth metals should now pay for China's cleanup. As you might expect, there's quite a few people that disagree with that. The Chinese government, after all, benefited by achieving a near monopoly in this area by choosing to operate a lax regulatory environment. As a result, companies in other parts of the world, such as in California, went broke because they couldn't compete with those low prices. If you say that companies that paid a low price for the minerals must now pay an additional charge to clean up the mess caused by those low prices, effectively what you're doing is retrospectively raising the price of minerals that were bought in the past. And that would be a huge market distortion. Had the real price been charged at the point of sale, then the situation might have been very different. A great deal more competition. So no, the government that set the lax regulatory regime bears the cost of its own policies because it was one of the key beneficiaries. 
Now, one of the consequences of China's pricing was America's own rare earth mining operation. And it's worth just cantering through the history of this. Back in 1952, Mountain Pass was opened, which until the 1990s was the only major source of rare earths worldwide. But that all changed, and it changed rapidly. Various pollution incidents hit the mine. So, for instance, in 1996, the pipeline ruptured no fewer than 11 times, spilling 380,000 gallons of heavily contaminated water. But it hit the end in 2002, by which time China was producing rare earths at low cost, and Mountain Pass was shut down. In 2008, a group of investors formed Molly Corp, and put forward a bold Project Phoenix plan to resurrect Mountain Pass. Molly Corp said that it could compete with China even though its technology wasn't yet mature and the barriers to entry were quite high. Lots of people smelt a rat, but, you know, sometimes the scent of money drowns everything else out. So, in spite of reservations, it got support, and for a while it looked like it was going to pay off. China hit Japan with its export ban in 2010 and restricted exports generally, and as a result, prices spiked. That sent Mollycorp's stock skywards, and the company started talking about new acquisitions of plants in Arizona and Estonia and other places besides. And yeah, that didn't last. Its experimental technologies displayed the significant inconvenience of not working. And finally, it went bankrupt in 2014. If the Obama administration had seen rare earths as critical to national security like the government does now, would that have been allowed to play out the way that it did? Who knows? Mountain Pass is now seeing another revival. It was bought by MP Mine Operation, which is now the standard bearer for the US fight back. The 38,000 megatons of rare earths from the US comes from Mountain Pass, which went back into production in 2018. And this is what we will now see accelerating. The more China threatens to weaponize its advantage, the more the pricing of rare earths will increase and thereby support the development of capacity elsewhere. And it's worth noting as well that when China first interrupted supply to Japan in 2010, Japanese car makers such as Toyota and Honda greatly reduced and in some cases even eliminated rare earth elements from the magnets used in their electric motors. And other large industries found that they could also do without at least some of the rare earths that they used. The oil industry and the glass making industry were two others that managed to find alternatives. And we're going to see that again. However, it's harder to do that for the defence industries. But if it was just down to those industries, you could probably get by, because crucially important as they are, they are still only 5% of the total market. So where does this leave us? This issue has been a reminder to those of us that believe in the power of a market, that although it's good for many things, it doesn't think strategically. Governments of whichever colour can't wholly delegate their responsibilities to the market to sort out. Yes, generally speaking, if something becomes important and scarce, that will be reflected in the price and the market will adapt accordingly. But in this case, a strategic state entity was able to distort the market by underpricing everyone else, driving them out of business and then using its market dominance of strategically important materials as a political weapon. We are in a situation of our own making. We arguably sleepwalked into it, thinking that we were in a wonderful post-power politics world in which all nations cooperate for the greater good. Once again, we have to see the world the way that it is, not the way that we'd like it to be. This is serious, but it's fixable. New extraction sources will come on stream as they are given priority. New processing capacity will be built as it becomes economically viable. China does, however, have at least a decade-long window where it can create enormous disruption. We're in a chess game where the other side has the advantage and we need to play really smartly to bring the game to a draw. That's worth remembering as we get distracted by the noise and the more immediate outrage and gratification of culture wars and politics as usual. This is the game that we really need to keep an eye on.